Disc 07, Pyramids By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 7x17 Can you work out where the nodes will form, said Taklisp. And come away over here, all the lads are staring. Pull yourself together, son. I.I.B. instinctively put his hand to his belt abacus. Well, yes, probably, he said. It's just a function of mass distribution and right, said the builder firmly. Start doing it. And then get all the foremen to come and see me. There was a glint like Micah in Taklas Psy. His jaw was squared like a block of granite. Maybe it's the pyramid that's got me thinking like this, he said, I'm thinking fast, I know it. And get your brother up here, too, he added. It is the pyramid effect. I'm remembering an idea I'm going to have. Best not to think too hard about that. Be practical. He stared around at the half-completed site. The gods knew we couldn't do it in time, he said. Now we don't have to. We can take as long as we like. Are you all right, said I.I.B. Dad, are you all right? Was that one of your time loops, said Taklisp dreamily. What an idea. No one would ever beat them on a contract ever again, they'd win bonuses for completion and it didn't matter how long it took. No. Dad, we ought but you're sure you can work out where these loops will occur, are you? Yes, I expect so, but good. Taklisp was trembling with excitement. Maybe they'd have to pay the men more, but it would be worth it, and IIA would be bound to think up some sort of scheme, finance was nearly as good as magic. The lads would have to accept it. After all, they'd complained about working with free men, they'd complained about working with Houndanians, they'd complained about working with everyone except proper paid-up guild members. So they could hardly complain about working with themselves. IIB stepped back, and gripped the abacus for reassurance. Dad, he said cautiously, what are you thinking about? Taklas beamed at him. Doppelgongs, he said. Politics was more interesting. Tepic felt that here, at least, he could make a contribution. Jalabibi was old. It was respected. But it was also small and in the sword-edged sense which was what seemed to matter these days, had no power. It wasn't always thus, as Dios told it. Once it had ruled the world by sheer force of nobility, hardly needing the standing army of 25,000 men it had in those high days. Now it wielded a more subtle power as a narrow state between the huge and thrusting empires of Sword and Ephib, each one both a threat and a shield. For more than a thousand years the kings along the Jul had, with extreme diplomacy, exquisite manners and the footwork of a centipede on adrenaline, kept the peace along the whole Wittershin side of the continent. Merely having existed for seven thousand years can be a formidable weapon, if you use it properly. You mean we're neutral ground, said Tepic. Sword is a desert culture like us, said Dios, steepling his hands. We have helped to shape it over the years. As for Ephib he sniffed. They have some very strange beliefs. How do you mean? They believe the world is run by geometry, sire. All lines and angles and numbers. That sort of thing, sire Dios frowned. Can lead to some very unsound ideas. Ah, said Tepic resolving to learn more about unsound ideas as soon as possible. So we're secretly on the side of sort, yes. No. It is important that Ephib remains strong. But we've more in common with sort. So we allow them to believe, sire. But they are a desert culture. Dios smiled. I am afraid they don't take pyramids seriously, sire. Tepic considered all this. So whose side are we really on? Our own, sire. There is always a way. 
Always remember, sire, that your family was on its third dynasty before our neighbors had worked out, sire, how babies are made. The Tsort delegation did indeed appear to have studied Jili culture assiduously, almost frantically. It was also clear that they hadn't begun to understand it, they'd merely borrowed as many bits as seemed useful and then put them together in subtly wrong ways. For example, to a man they employed the three-turning walk, as portrayed on friezes, and only used by the Jolie court on certain occasions. Occasional grimaces crossed their faces as their vertebrae protested. They were also wearing the cruspids of mourning and the bangles of going forth, as well as the kilt of yet with, and no wonder even the maidens on fan duty were hiding their smiles, matching greaves, asterisk, asterisk some translation is needed here. If a foreign ambassador to the court of St. James wore, out of a genuine desire to flatter, a bowler hat, a claymore, a civil war breastplate, Saxon trousers and a Jacobean haircut, he'd create pretty much the same impression. Even Tepic had to cough hurriedly. But then, he thought, they don't know any better. They're like children. And this thought was followed by another one which added, these children could wipe us off the map in one hour. Hot on the synapses of the other two came a third thought, which said, It's only clothes, for goodness sake, you're beginning to take it all seriously. The group from Ephib were more sensibly dressed in white togas. They had a certain sameness about them, as if somewhere in the country there was a little press that stamped out small bald men with curly white beards. The two parties halted before the throne, and bowed. Halo, said Tepic. His Greatness the King Tepi Chimon XXVIII, Lord of the Heavens, Charioteer of the Wagon of the Sun, Steersman of the Bark of the Sun, Guardian of the Secret Knowledge, Lord of the Horizon, Keeper of the Way, the Flail of Mercy, the Highborn One, the Never Dying King, bids you welcome and commands you to take wine with him said Dios, clapping his hands for a butler. Oh yes, said Tepic. Do sit down, won't you? His Greatness the King Tepi Chimon XXVIII, Lord of the Heavens, Charioteer of the Wagon of the Sun, Steersman of the Bark of the Sun, Guardian of the Secret Knowledge, Lord of the Horizon, Keeper of the Way, the Flail of Mercy, the Highborn One, the Never Dying King commands you to be seated, said Dios. Tepic racked his brains for a suitable speech. He'd heard plenty in Ankh-Morpork. They were probably the same the whole world over. I'm sure we shall get on His Greatness the King Tepi Chimon XXVIII, Lord of the Heavens, Charioteer of the Wagon of the Sun, Steersman of the Bark of the Sun, Guardian of the Secret Knowledge, Lord of the Horizon, Keeper of the Way, the Flail of Mercy, the Highborn One, the Never Dying King, bids you hearken. Dios boomed. Long history of friendship hearkened to the wisdom of His Greatness the King Tepi Chimon XXVIII, Lord of the Heavens, Charioteer of the Wagon of the Sun, Steersman of the Bark of the Sun, Guardian of the Secret Knowledge, Lord of the Horizon, Keeper of the Way, the Flail of Mercy the highborn one, the never-dying king. The echoes died away. Could I have a word with you a moment, Dios? The high priest leaned down. Is all this necessary, hissed Tepic. Dios's aquiline features took on the wooden expression of one who is wrestling with an unfamiliar concept. Of course, sire. It is traditional, he said, at last. I thought I was supposed to talk to these people. You know, about boundaries and trade and so on. I've been doing a lot of thinking about it and I've got several ideas. I mean, it's going to be a little difficult if you are going to keep shouting. Dios gave him a polite smile. Oh no, sire. That has all been sorted out, sire. I met with them this morning. What am I supposed to do, then? Dios made a slight circling motion with his hand. Just as you wish, 
sire. It is normal to smile a little, and put them at their ease. Is that all sire could ask them whether they enjoy being diplomats, sire, said Dios. He met Tepic's glare with eyes as expressionless as mirrors. I am the king, Tepic hissed. Certainly, sire. It would not do to sully the office with mere matters of leaden state, sire. Tomorrow, sire, you will be holding supreme court. A very fit office for a monarch, sire. Ah. Yes. It was quite complicated. Tepic listened carefully to the case, which was alleged cattle theft compounded by Jilly's onion-layered land laws. This is what it should be all about, he thought. No one else can work out who owns the bloody ox, this is the sort of thing kings have to do. Now, let's see, five years ago, he sold the ox to him, but as it turned out he looked from the face of one worried farmer to the other. They were both clutching their ragged straw hats close to their chests, and both of them wore the paralyzed wooden expressions of simple men who, in pursuit of their parochial disagreement, now found themselves on a marble floor in a great room with their god enthroned before their very eyes. Tepic didn't doubt that either one would cheerfully give up all rights to the wretched creature in exchange for being ten miles away. It's a fairly mature ox, he thought, time it was slaughtered even if it's his it's been fattening on his neighbor's land all these years, half each would be about right, they're really going to remember this judgment. He raised the sickle of justice. His Greatness the King Tepi Chimon XXVIII, Lord of the Heavens, Charioteer of the Wagon of the Sun, Steersman of the Bark of the Sun, Guardian of the Secret Knowledge, Lord of the Horizon, Keeper of the Way, the Flail of Mercy, the high-born one, the never-dying king, will give judgment. Cower to the justice of his greatness the king Tep Tepic cut Dios off in mid in tone. Having listened to both sides of the case, he said firmly, the mask giving it a slight boom, and, being impressed by the argument and counter-argument, it seems to us only just that the beast in question should be slaughtered without delay and shared with all fairness between both plaintiff and defendant. He sat back. They'll call me Tepic the Wise, he thought. The common people go for this sort of thing. The farmers gave him a long blank stare. Then, as if they were both mounted on turntables, they turned and looked to where Dios was sitting in his place on the steps in a group of lesser priests. Dios stood up, smoothed his plain robe, and extended the staff. Hearken to the interpreted wisdom of his greatness the King Tepi Chimon XXVIII, Lord of the Heavens, Charioteer of the Wagon of the Sun, Steersman of the Bark of the Sun, Guardian of the Secret Knowledge, Lord of the Horizon, Keeper of the Way, the Flail of Mercy, the Highborn One, the Never-Dying King, he said. It is our divine judgment that the beast in dispute is the property of Rumus Foot. It is our divine judgment that the beast be sacrificed upon the altar of the concourse of gods and thanks for the attention of our divine self. It is our further judgment that both Rumusfut and Ktofa work a further three days in the fields of the king in payment for this judgment. Dios raised his head until he was looking along his fearsome nose right into Tepic's mask. He raised both hands. Mighty is the wisdom of his greatness the king Tepi Chimon XXVIII. Lord of the Heavens, Charioteer of the Wagon of the Sun, Steersman of the Bark of the Sun, Guardian of the Secret Knowledge, Lord of the Horizon, Keeper of the Way, the Flail of Mercy, the Highborn One, the Never-Dying King. The farmers bobbed in terrified gratitude and backed out of the presence, framed between the guards. Dios, said Tepic, levelly. Sire. Just attend upon me a moment, please. Sire, repeated Dios, materializing by the throne. I could not help noticing, Dios, excuse me if I am wrong, a certain flourish in the translation there. The priest looked surprised. Indeed no, Sire. I was most precise in relaying your decision, 
saving only to refine the detail in accordance with precedent and tradition. How was that? The damn creature really belonged to both of them. But Rumusfoot is known to be punctilious in his devotions, sire, seeking every opportunity to laud and magnify the gods, whereas Ktafel has been known to harbor foolish thoughts. What's that got to do with justice? Everything, sire, said Dios smoothly. But now neither of them has the ox. Quite so, sire. But Ktafel does not have it because he does not deserve it, while Rumusfoot, by his sacrifice, has ensured himself greater stature in the netherworld. And you'll eat beef tonight, I suppose, said Tepic. It was like a blow, Tepic might as well have picked up the throne and hit the priest with it. Dios took a step backward, aghast, his eyes two brief pools of pain. When he spoke, there was a raw edge to his voice. I do not eat meat, sire, he said. It dilutes and tarnishes the soul. May I summon the next case, sire? Tepic nodded. Very well. The next case was a dispute over the rent of a hundred square yards of riverside land. Tepic listened carefully. Good growing land was at a premium in Jali, since the pyramids took up so much of it. It was a serious matter. It was especially serious because the land's tenant was by all accounts hard-working and conscientious, while its actual owner was clearly rich and objectionable star. Asterisk younger assassins, who are usually very poor, have very clear ideas about the morality of wealth until they become older assassins, who are usually very rich, when they begin to take the view that injustice has its good points. Unfortunately, However one chose to stack the facts, he was also in the right. Tepic thought deeply, and then squinted at Dios. The priest nodded at him. It seems to me, said Tepic, as fast as possible but not fast enough. Hearken to the judgment of His Greatness the King Tepi Chimon XXVIII, Lord of the Heavens, Charioteer of the Wagon of the Sun, Steersman of the Bark of the Sun, Guardian of the Secret Knowledge, Lord of the Horizon, Keeper of the Way, the Flail of Mercy, the Highborn One, the Never-Dying King. It seems to me, to us, Tepic repeated, that, taking all matters in consideration beyond those of mere mortal artifice, the true and just outcome in this matter he paused. This, he thought, isn't how a good king speaks. The landlord has been weighed in the balance and found wanting, he boomed through the mask's mouth slit. We find for the tenant. As one man the court turned to Dios, who held a whispered consultation with the other priests and then stood up. Hear now the interpreted word of his greatness the King Tepi Chimon XXVIII, Lord of the Heavens, Charioteer of the Wagon of the Sun, Steersman of the Bark of the Sun, Guardian of the Secret Knowledge. Lord of the Horizon, Keeper of the Way, the Flail of Mercy, the Highborn One, the Never-Dying King. Turn the farmer will at once pay eighteen tunes in back rent to Prince Mtibos. Prince Mbetos will at once pay twelve tunes into the temple offerings of the gods of the river. Long live the king. Bring on the next case. Tepic beckoned to Dios again. Is there any point in me being here? he demanded in an overheated whisper. Please be calm, sire. If you were not here, how would the people know that justice had been done? But you twist everything I say. No, sire. Sire, you give the judgment of the man. I interpret the judgment of the king. I see, said Tepic grimly. Well, from now on there was a commotion outside the hall. Clearly there was a prisoner outside who was less than confident in the king's justice, and the king didn't blame him. He wasn't at all happy about it, either. It turned out to be a dark-haired girl, struggling in the arms of two guards and giving them the kind of blows with fist and heel that a man would blush to give. She wasn't wearing the right kind of costume for the job, either. 
it would be barely adequate for lying around peeling grapes in. She saw Tepic and, to his secret delight, flashed him a glance of pure hatred. After an afternoon of being treated like a mentally deficient statue it was a pleasure to find someone prepared to take an interest in him. He didn't know what she had done, but judging by the thumps she was landing on the guards it was a pretty good bet that she had done it to the very limits of her ability. Dio's bent down to the level of the mask's ear holes. Her name is Tracy, he said. A handmaiden of your father. She has refused to take the potion. What potion, said Tepic. It is customary for a dead king to take servants with him into the netherworld, sire. Tepic nodded gloomily. It was a jealously guarded privilege, the only way a penniless servant could ensure immortality. He remembered grandfather's funeral, and the discreet clamor of the old man's personal servants. It had made father depressed for days. Yes, but it's not compulsory, he said. Yes, sire. It is not compulsory. Father had plenty of servants. I gather she was his favorite, sire. What exactly has she done wrong, then? Dio's sighed as one might if one were explaining things to an extremely backward child. She has refused to take the potion, sire. Sorry. I thought you said it wasn't compulsory, Dios. Yes, sire. It is not, sire. It is entirely voluntary. It is an act of free will. And she has refused it, sire. Ah. One of those situations, said Tepic. Jalabibi was built on those sort of situations. Trying to understand them could drive you mad. If one of his ancestors had decreed that night was day, people would go around groping in the light. He leaned forward. Step forward, young lady, he said. She looked at Dio's. His Greatness the King Tepi Chimon XXVIII do we have to go all through that every time? Yes, sire. Lord of the heavens, charioteer of the wagon of the sun, steersman of the bark of the sun, guardian of the secret knowledge, lord of the horizon, keeper of the way, the flail of mercy, the highborn one, the never-dying king, bids you declare your guilt. The girl shook herself out of the guard's grip and faced Tepic, trembling with terror. He told me he didn't want to be buried in a pyramid, she said. He said the idea of those millions of tons of rock on top of him gave him nightmares. I don't want to die yet. You refuse to gladly take the poison, said Dios. Yes. But, child, said Dios then the king will have you put to death anyway. Surely it is better to go honorably, to a worthy life in the netherworld. I don't want to be a servant in the netherworld. There was a groan of horror from the assembled priests. Dios nodded. Then the eater of souls will take you, he said. Sire, we look to your judgment. Tepic realized he was staring at the girl. There was something hauntingly familiar about her which he couldn't quite put his finger on. Let her go, he said. His Greatness the King Tepi Chimon XXVIII, Lord of the Heavens, Charioteer of the Wagon of the Sun, Steersman of the Bark of the Sun, Guardian of the Secret Knowledge, Lord of the Horizon, Keeper of the Way, the Flail of Mercy, the Highborn One, the Never-Dying King, has spoken. Tomorrow at dawn you will be cast to the crocodiles of the river. Great is the wisdom of the king. Tracy turned and glared at Tepic. He said nothing. He did not dare, for fear of what it might become. She went away quietly, which was worse than sobbing or shouting. That is the last case, sire, said Dios. I will retire to my quarters, said Tepic coldly. I have much to think about. Therefore I will have dinner sent in, said the priest. It will be roast chicken. I hate chicken. Dios smiled. 
No, sire. On Wednesdays the king always enjoys chicken, sire. The pyramids flared. The light they cast on the landscape was curiously subdued, grainy, almost grey, but over the capstone of each tomb a zigzag flame crackled towards the sky. A faint click of metal and stone sprang to see from a fitful doze into extreme wakefulness. She stood up very carefully and crept towards the window. Unlike proper cell windows, which should be large and airy and requiring only the removal of a few inconvenient iron bars to ensure the escape of any captives, this window was a slit six inches wide. Seven thousand years had taught the kings along the jewel that cells should be designed to keep prisoners in. The only way they could get out through this slit was in bits. But there was a shadow against the pyramid light, and a voice said, PSST she flattened herself against the wall and tried to reach up to the slit. Who are you? I'm here to help you. Oh damn! Do they call this a window? Look, I'm lowering a rope. A thick silken cord, knotted at intervals, dropped past her shoulder. She stared at it for a second or two, and then kicked off her curly-toed shoes and climbed up it. The face on the other side of the slit was half concealed by a black hood, but she could just make out a worried expression. Don't despair, it said. I wasn't despairing. I was trying to get some sleep. Oh. Pardon me, I'm sure. I'll just go away and leave you, shall I? But in the morning I shall wake up and then I'll despair. What are you standing on, demon? Do you know what a crampon is? No well, it's two of them. They stared at each other in silence. Okay, said the face at last. I'll have to go around and come in through the door. Don't go away. And with that it vanished upwards. Tracy let herself slide back down to the chilly stones of the floor. Come in through the door. She wondered how it could manage that. Humans would need to open it first. She crouched in the furthest corner of the cell, staring at the small rectangle of wood. Long minutes went past. At one point she thought she heard a tiny noise, like a gasp. A little later there was subtle clink of metal so slight as to be almost beyond the range of hearing. More time wound on to the spool of eternity and then the silence beyond the cell, which had been the silence caused by absence of sound, very slowly became the silence caused by someone making no noise. She thought. It's right outside the door. There was a pause in which Tepic oiled all the bolts and hinges so that, when he made the final assault, the door swished open in heart-gripping noiselessness. I say, said a voice in the darkness. Tracy pressed herself still further into the corner. Look, I've come to rescue you. Now she could make out a blacker shadow in the flare light. It stepped forward with rather more uncertainty than she would have expected from a demon. Are you coming or not, it said. I've only knocked out the guards it's not their fault, but we haven't got a lot of time. I'm to be thrown to the crocodiles in the morning, whispered Tracy. The king himself decreed it. He probably made a mistake. Tracy's eyes widened in horrified disbelief. The soul eater will take me, she said. Do you want it to? Tracy hesitated. Well, then, said the figure and took her unresisting hand. He led her out of the cell, where she nearly tripped over the prone body of a guard. Who is in the other cells, he said, pointing to the line of doors along the passage. I don't know, said Tracy. Let's find out, shall we? The figure touched akin to the bolts and hinges of the next door and pushed it open. The flare from the narrow window illuminated a middle-aged man, seated cross-legged on the floor. I'm here to rescue you, said the demon. The man peered up at him. Rescue, he said. Yes. Why are you here? The man hung his head. 
I spoke blasphemy against the king. How did you do that? I dropped a rock on my foot. Now my tongue is to be torn out. The dark figure nodded sympathetically. A priest heard you, did he, he said. No. I told a priest. Such words should not go unpunished, said the man virtuously. We're really good at it, Tepic thought. Mere animals couldn't possibly manage to act like this. You need to be a human being to be really stupid. I think we ought to talk about this outside, he said. Why not come with me? The man pulled back and glared at him. You want me to run away, he said. Seems a good idea, wouldn't you say? The man stared into his eyes, his lips moving silently. Then he appeared to reach a decision. Guards, he screamed. The shout echoed through the sleeping palace. His would-be rescuer stared at him in disbelief. Mad, Tepix said. You're all mad. He stepped out of the room, grabbed Tracy's hand, and hurried along the shadowy passages. Behind them the prisoner made the most of his tongue while he still had it and used it to scream a stream of imprecations. Where are you taking me, said Tracy, as they marched smartly around a corner and into a pillar-barred courtyard. Tepic hesitated. He hadn't thought much beyond this point. Why do they bother to bolt the doors, he demanded, eyeing the pillars. That's what I want to know. I'm surprised you didn't wander back to your cell while I was in there. I... I don't want to die, she said quietly. Don't blame you. You mustn't say that. It's wrong not to want to die. Tepic glanced up at the roof around the courtyard and unslung his grapnel. I think I ought to go back to my cell, said Tracy, without actually making any move in that direction. It's wrong even to think of disobeying the king. Oh. What happens to you, then? Something bad, she said vaguely. You mean, worse than being thrown to the crocodiles or having your soul taken by the soul eater, said Tepic, and caught the grapnel firmly on some hidden ledge on the flat roof. That's an interesting point, said Tracy, winning the Tepic award for clear thinking. Worth considering, isn't it? Tepic tested his weight on the cord. What you're saying is, if the worst is going to happen to you anyway, you might as well not bother any more, said Tracy. If the Soul Eater is going to get you whatever you do, you might as well avoid the crocodiles, is that it? You go up first, said Tepic, I think someone's coming. Who are you? Tepic fished in his pouch. He'd come back to Jolie and Ian ago with just the clothes he stood up in, but they were the clothes he'd stood up in throughout his exam. He balanced a number two throwing knife in his hand, the steel glinting in the flare light. It was possibly the only steel in the country, it wasn't that Jalabibi hadn't heard about iron, it was just that if copper was good enough for your great-great-great-great-grandfather, it was good enough for you. No, the guards didn't deserve knives. They hadn't done anything wrong. His hand closed over the little mesh bag of caltrops. These were a small model, a mere one inch per spike. Caltrops didn't kill anyone, they just slowed them down a bit. One or two of them in the sole of the foot induced extreme slowness and caution in all except the terminally enthusiastic. He scattered a few across the mouth of the passage and ran back to the rope, hauling himself up in a few quick swings. He reached the roof just as the leading guards ran under the lintel. He waited until he heard the first curse, and then coiled up the rope and hurried after the girl. They'll catch us, she said. I don't think so. And then the king will have us thrown to the crocodiles. Oh no, I don't think Tepic paused. It was an intriguing idea. He might, he ventured. It's very hard to be sure about anything. So what shall we do now? Tepic stared across the river, where the pyramids were ablaze. 
The Great Pyramid was still under construction, by flare light, a swarm of blocks, dwarfed by distance, hovered near its tip. The amount of labor Taklasp was putting on the job was amazing. What a flare that will give, he thought. It'll be seen all the way to Ank. Horrible things, aren't they, said Tracy, behind him. Do you think so? They're creepy. The old king hated them, you know. He said they nailed the kingdom to the past. Did he say why? No. He just hated them. He was a nice old boy. Very kind. Not like this new one. She blew her nose and replaced her handkerchief in its scarcely adequate space in her sequined bra. E.R., what exactly did you have to do? As a handmaiden, I mean, said Tepic, scanning the rooftop panorama to hide his embarrassment. She giggled. You're not from around here, are you? No. Not really. Talk to him, mainly. Or just listen. He could really talk, but he always said no one ever really listened to what he said. Yes, said Tepic, with feeling. And that was all, was it? She stared at him, and then giggled again. Oh, that? No, he was very kind. I wouldn't have minded, you understand, I had all the proper training. Bit of a disappointment, really. The women of my family have served under the kings for centuries, you know. Oh yes, he managed. I don't know whether you've ever seen a book, it's called The Shuttered Palace, said Tepic automatically. I thought a gentleman like you'd know about it, said Tracy, nudging him. It's a sort of textbook. Well, my great-great-grandmother posed for a lot of the pictures. Not recently. She added, in case he hadn't fully understood, I mean, that would be a bit off-putting, she's been dead for twenty-five years. When she was younger. I look a lot like her, everyone says. Erk, agreed Tepic. She was famous. She could put her feet behind her head, you know. So can I. I've got my grade three. Erk. The old king told me once that the gods gave people a sense of humor to make up for giving them sex. I think he was a bit upset at the time. Erk. Only the whites of Tepic's eyes were showing. You don't say much, do you? The breeze of the night was blowing her perfume towards him. Tracy used scent like a battering ram. We've got to find somewhere to hide you, he said concentrating on each word. Haven't you got any parents or anything? He tried to ignore the fact that in the shadowless flare light she appeared to glow, and didn't have much success. Well, my mother still works in the palace somewhere, said Tracy. But I don't think she'd be very sympathetic. We've got to get you away from here, said Tepic fervently. If you can hide somewhere today, I can steal some horses or a boat or something. Then you could go to Tsort or Ephib or somewhere. Foreign, you mean? Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.